Hi, everybody. This is Chris Doherty, Vice President for Academic Affairs and Dean of the Faculty at Chestnut Hill College. Uh, so happy to be joined this morning by Dr. Suzanne Del Guizzo. Uh, we're having this interview today on Monday, March 30th. Suzanne Del Guizzo is Associate Professor, Associate Professor of English and Chair of the Center for Integrated Humanities at Chestnut Hill College. She's also editor of the Hemingway Review. Suzanne has published more than 20 articles in scholarly journals and has co-edited three books, Ernest Hemingway's The Garden of Eden, 25 Years of Criticism with Frederick Svoboda, and Ernest Hemingway in Context with Deborah A. Modelmog, and The New Hemingway Studies with Kirk Kernett, both from Cambridge University Press. New Hemingway Studies is coming out this July. Dr. Del Guizzo has also been providing leadership to initiatives in the area of health humanities, including a health humanities minor at Chestnut Hill College. She holds a PhD in English literature from Tulane University, an MA in English liter language and literature from the University of Chicago, and a BA in English and literature and philosophy with highest honors from New York University. And uh, so happy today. We're going to be talking about a few things um, with Suzanne, um, uh, just perspectives on her, her teaching, um, perspectives on her work in the area of health humanities, and also um, sharing some really interesting information with regard to um, Hemingway's personal history and the uh, pandemic of, of 1918 and some of the things that, that can help us um, think through and, and know about um, given the lens of, of his work as, as an author. So thanks for joining me this morning, Suzanne. It's great to, great to have this conversation. Really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, first, uh, one of the initiatives that you've been leading at the college is work in the area of, of health humanities. So thinking about that, thinking about the current moment that we're in, um, what have your thoughts been about that field? How have you been engaging conversations in that field um, since this has all started? Yeah, you know, one of the things that I've been struck by just reading the coverage in, in the press every morning is how much the humanities and the arts have been a part of the conversation, even in this most dire of moments when we're trying to figure out the math of the pandemic and um, and we're dealing with frontline stress in our healthcare facilities. Um, everywhere from like the very big issues, like the philosophical and ethical complexity of the triage moment and deciding who gets care, when and how, um, to more personal ethical choices, like following stay at home orders um, and social distancing orders and understanding our role as interconnected people in a, in a complex society. But then also I've been struck by how immediately arts in particular and humanities um, were seen as an essential part of life, right? All of a sudden everybody is, uh, and the theater started to stream great theater, the Met started to stream opera, um, people are writing in their social media posts that they're reading more, cooking new things, taking, drawing. Um, it's as if all of a sudden, you know, when we were isolated and under stress, we needed to touch those things that made us most human. So for me, all of that just testifies to the really complex connection between um, what I would call sort of the science of keeping us well and the humanness of keeping us well. You're muted, Chris. It's been a remarkable time seeing all that happening and um... And I, you know, really grateful just for the work uh, that you and each of your faculty have done um, in in making that present to making that present to our students. Um, yeah. And so we've heard so many of the stories of the healthcare workers this month, what they've been asked to manage, um, what they've been asked to respond to. Um, you know, hearing those stories, what do those narratives tell us? Um, what what are we learning from those narratives? So, well, I think it's going to take us some time to really process the narratives. The way I see it is we're in this moment of incredible um, immediate stress, and we're looking for um, paths, human paths through that stress. And, and I believe that hearing each other and listening to our narratives allows us to do that. Um, so far, though, I think what we're hearing is, you know, our tales of incredible bravery. I was reading an article just this morning about the healthcare workers in New York and how at some hospitals, half the staff are now stricken. Um, my father, who is a chief medical officer of a hospital in New Jersey, is in a high risk group. He's over 80 years old. 
he is showing up every single day to the hospital. Um, when I expressed concern for him because he was doing that, he said, this is what I do. You know, I'm a fireman. I run into the fire. You know, that's what he said. And I realized that they, he doesn't really have, you know, a choice. And so whenever I think of how I'm finding it difficult to stay at home or, you know, not go out to dinner on a Friday night, I really think about how my responsibility out of respect for what they're risking, you know, to do the small things that I can do. But I think the real um, heartbreaking narratives, uh, you know, doctors and nurses, I grew up in a medical family, as, as you know, um, they lose patients and uh, that is to be expected, but not on this kind of scale. And so even for people who are accustomed to loss and to death, this is going to be a hugely traumatizing experience. And also for patient survivors and families. And later on, when we talk about the 1918 epidemic, we know from survivor stories there, the deep trauma, both on the, on the part of medical care workers, but also people who you know, didn't know if they were infected and infected other people, just all of the ways that we have to cope after a moment like this with our, our connections. So I think, you know, some of the hard work of the humanities will happen after this immediate response. It'll be involved in archiving, um, capturing, creating the history, and also just handling the narratives of trauma. But I think, you know, what we are seeing is that there is a huge reset here um, in a variety of ways where we have to understand our connection to each other and to our environment suddenly in a wholly new way. And humanities gives us a course and a path to, to start to ask those questions. So see how that, you know, but I do think the majority of the, of the heavy lifting on the part of humanities happens sort of after this initial wave. You know, one of the things I'm mindful of is, as um, I have these conversations with faculty is I always point out that the, the, the point in time at which we're having the conversation. So here we are, Monday, March 30th, we are coming off a weekend where some of the predictions that we're beginning to hear um, are sharing numbers that are a lot more scary in terms of what we with regard to fatalities, um, what we're seeing in terms of changes in behave, behavior, um, recommendations now to go through the whole of April, um, continuing the social distancing. And I just, I do that to mark the moment of this conversation because I think, you know, it's just changing daily, weekly. And to, to think about your comments in terms of how we make sense of this. Um, mm -hmm. Well, Chris, just to, forward. if I may, you know, just to say, you, you know that I was supposed to be attending um, a medical narrative conference in New York on April 17th, and it seemed absolutely absurd to me when it got canceled. I thought, <laughs> why is this getting, <laughs> that was about a week or a week and a half ago, and now New York is almost a no-go zone. Um, and, unless you were already there, it's it's you know ground zero for this for this pandemic in the United States. So it's changed so quickly; it's almost mind-boggling. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, shifting your work as a as a Hemingway scholar um, and and thinking about how that informs your perspectives, I, I thought it was fascinating when you share with me your, your your thoughts about this conversation, particularly the way in which it would function as a guest lecture for other courses at the, the college um, and just everything about the flu pandemic of 1918, um, Ernest Hemingway's personal history, um, you know, his time in, in, the, in the war and how that all intersected. And, um, I, you know, I just thought it was a fascinating uh, perspective. C can you just give us some context of what that, that particular pandemic was like, what that flu was like? Um, yeah. So that those of us who may not be as familiar with it can have a, a sense of what um, what that meant at the time and, and just what was happening at that time. Yeah. So this is a little bit, um, as I was thinking about this and reminding myself um, about these numbers, I realized this is a bit of a scary exercise in a moment like this. So I'd like to preface it with the fact that um, in the Atlantic recently, there was uh, this article, the coronavirus is the 1918 pandemic. But the answer is that our outcomes are going to be so much better um, because of the state of medical care um, and the healthcare system. 
um, when the 1918 uh, pandemic hit, they didn't, there was, germ theory was still relatively new. They weren't even sure how it was being transmitted. They had a sense of it as being in the atmosphere, which is not entirely incorrect, but the word influenza comes from the Italian word to influence. Um, because it was just felt like it was in the in the air around you. And interestingly enough, the word quarantine comes from the Italian quaranta, which is um, 40 days that sailors coming to Venice would have to be quarantined on an island right off of Venice um, during the bubonic plague. So um, all of this is very ancient um, roots, but we're in such a better position than any other pandemic um, ever, you know, to, to handle what we are seeing. But um, yeah, the pandemic of 1918 struck in uh, three waves. And the first wave was uh, probably March to September of 1918. And although there's a lot of um, speculation or lack of certainty about where the, the um, influenza began, uh, one theory, and it's one that I'll explore with you in detail because of Hemingway's connection to it, was that it started in Camp Funston, Texas, uh, not sorry, Texas, Kansas, Camp Funston and Fort Riley, uh, Kansas, um, in the army barracks there. And that the American soldiers carried it, 1.5 million American soldiers uh, were moving into Europe to assist in uh, World War One. And they uh, likely brought the flu uh, to France and then throughout the rest of Europe. Um, and the, the deadliest wave of the flu came from August or September 1918 to early December. And in that moment of the flu killed two thirds of all the people that would die in that flu. So it was a very intense few months. And then uh, the last wave went through the following spring, summer, um, and there were spot cases up until 1920. Um, but the flu killed a total of, and these estimates are huge, 50 to 100 million people worldwide. And again, two thirds of those people were killed in the 24 week period of September to early December. So the, the, the scale of loss of life was incredible. And to put it into perspective, um, it's more people than were killed in World War I and World War II combined. So combat casualties in World War I were about 9.2 million. Uh, in World War II, there are about 15.9 million. So this was an incredible loss of, of life. The other really striking thing, there are two other striking things about this flu. One is that it seemed somehow, for some reason, to disproportionately affect young people, ages 20 to 40. And so you can imagine the combination of the war, you know, just the young people being in tight quarters together, parades, rallies, uh, refugee movements, that was a particularly deadly mix uh, since this flu hit people ages 20 to 40. And the estimates are that it killed about eight to 10% of people that age worldwide during the pandemic. Um, in the United States, the flu killed uh, between 500 and 675,000 people. So that was, that's an incredible number. The other thing that is really striking about this particular flu, and it was a version, they believe, of H1N1. Um, it was, it was struck fast. So the other thing that was incredible is you could go from your first cough and, or sneeze to death in, in uh, 48 hours. And so it was very, very fast. So yeah, those, that's a little bit of history um, about that flu. And I think if we think about the stay at home order and the social distancing orders that we have now, it was exactly the opposite because it, it struck during a war where contact was kind of unavoidable. So. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting too, to see that reflected in some of the, the, the history of Philadelphia of our city. Um, and um, and how um, Philadelphia at the time was 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 at one point an epicenter for for that. So um, here's Hemingway in a period of time um, living this, experiencing it, writing about it. Um, share with us what we can learn about that phenomenon through his work and through what you know about him through your scholarship. 
Sure, yeah. So studying Hemingway, I always say it's, it's, it's sort of the oddest experience because he had a very big life. Um, you know, he was involved in almost every major event of the first half of the 20th century, and he knew all kinds of peoples from, you know, generals to bullfighters, to newspaper men and artists um, and hunters and fishermen. So he just lived a life that touched such a cross section, such a various array of, of other lives and other experiences. Um, in this case, you know, he was born in 1899. So he was 19 when the, um, when the pandemic hit. And he was living in Kansas City, Missouri, serving as a cub reporter for the Kansas City Star. And uh, he was very itching to get into World War I, as a lot of young men were, um, thinking that war was glorious and that it was a test of manhood. And uh, he joined the 7th um, Infantry of the Missouri National Guard. And, you know, as I said earlier, one of the theories about where the flu started, where the pandemic started, was at Camp Funston in Kansas. And Hemingway's unit would train there on Tuesday nights in the month of March, <laughs> which is the month of the pandemic or the beginning of the pandemic. So it says he has a first kind of brush with it, but um, he decides to sign up for the Red Cross Ambulance Corps in um, April of 1918. And so he gets ready, prepares to leave in May. Um, and then he goes uh, in through France and into Italy, where he served in the Red Cross Ambulance Corps, about six or seven weeks before the major troop movement of American soldiers went through. So, you know, if we imagine that, you know, there were reports even on the, on the transit ships of soldiers being sick with flu, um, that he was just about six weeks ahead of the flu <laughs> in, this, in this model. And then he was serving in the northern part of Italy when he was injured by a trench mortar shell um, in his legs. He had 227 wounds and he was recovering from those wounds in the American Red Cross, the American hospital in Milan. And that was when all of a sudden the flu started to move through the front lines, the trenches and, and kill soldiers there. So he was always just a little bit um, ahead of the flu, it seems. And then in um, 1918, when he was recovering from wounds, he fell in love with his nurse, Agnes von Krawski, who's an American. And uh, he was in the hospital with her on the night of October 4th, 1918, when she lost her first patient to the flu, Lieutenant Coulter. And uh, it is very likely that Hemingway was in the room with her, helping her care for him. Um, we have some indications in his writing that that's true, but we don't know it for a fact. Uh, and he, the flu, that experience haunted him in his writing for a very uh, long time. But we'll talk about the writing um, in a minute. I'll just go through the rest of the Hemingway family. Back in Oak Park, they were also being affected by the flu. Um, his, ol his older sister, Marceline, wrote to him in um, October or September of 1918 that mobs of people in Oak Park had it. And she lost two dear friends to the flu and one um, fellow trainee, she was training to be a social worker at the Chicago Congregationalist um, Training Center for Social Workers and she lost a fellow trainee there. She was helping flu patients, you know, masking up, helping to serve in whatever way she could. Um, his sister Ursula writes to him Another sister, Ursula, writes to him in, I guess it's probably November, maybe a little earlier of 1918, that the boy she was going with, Bobby Hurst, who thought a lot of Ernest, had died of the flu. And even his youngest sister, Carol, who was about, I, I could be getting this wrong, but I think she was about seven or eight when the flu broke out, she wrote him a letter complaining about the fact that she was in quarantine and couldn't go out of the yard. So everybody uh, in the family was affected by it, but probably most notably would have been Hemingway's father, who was a doctor and um, who wrote to his son letters about um, having to help out with the flu, seeing patients all day. 
he tried to keep a, an optimistic tone in the letters to Ernest. He, he was saying, I'm being used up all the way to my ability by the public, but his sister Marceline confessed that at one point he was exhausted and he hadn't slept in 48 hours. So the whole Hemingway family um, had some catch with it, but you know, it's amazing that immediate family, the Hemingway nuclear family uh, wound up relatively unscathed, but they had a very um, exotic and uh, fun aunt. Her name was Aunt Vada. Her name was Nevada Butler. She was a silver mining heiress. And uh, she married Lester Hall, who was Hemingway's maternal uncle. And she had just married Lester uh, before he went off to war. She went to meet the family for the first time in April of 1918, and they all fell in love with her. Everybody said she was enchanting, and she loved theater, and she had a pleasant, low speaking voice, and everybody just loved her and wanted, them, wanted her to stay with them, but she decided to go back to California, where she died of the flu, as Marceline wrote, pathetically alone. Because, and it was, it, she died in October, and it was sort of made worse by the fact that Uncle Lester had been missing in action in France, from September 15th. And then the real tragedy of the story, and one of the reasons why, you know, just this story happened so many times, it just happened in, to the Hemingway family. He wound up to be, he was alive, um, and he got on the ship to come home after the armistice, and he hadn't heard. And so he walked off the ship to find out that his wife had died while he was wow. at war. Yeah, missing in action. And that's yeah. a story repeated many, many times. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you share some fascinating um, piece of information um, just about, um, you know, about Hemingway's experience at the time, you know, and, and I, I think it's just such an, an interesting commentary on, on, on your work and just, and, 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 and what you know about his life and what his life represents in terms of, as you mentioned, the connections that he had at that time and in other times in his life. Um, so, Thinking about that, I'm thinking about his his um, his personal experience of this. Um, what else can you share about that about that personal history with us? So. Yeah. Well, so what's really interesting, you know, um, well, I think to me, especially now, is how very little mention the flu seems to get, the pandemic seems to get in Hemingway's work. Um, <laughs> In fact, there's only one direct mention of it in, in, in a sort of short story that's embedded in Death in the Afternoon in 1932, which is a book otherwise about bullfighting. And it's just about, it's, it seems to be the story of Coulter, Lieutenant Coulter's death. It's a description okay. of a, a firsthand account of somebody dying of pneumonia, which was usually what happened, the complications um, of pneumonia from the flu. And uh, it, it's very graphic. I don't want, I don't, especially now, don't want to read it. But, um, but then he, there is an unpublished short story that I think is really insightful called At One O'Clock in the Morning. And uh, it's, it's at the archives, the Hemingway archives up at uh, the JFK Library in Boston. But I have access to it through um, Peter, uh, a biography by Peter Griffin uh, called Along with Youth. But the, in the story, there's a young man who's a soldier who um, is dating a nurse, and she attends, they both attend the death of somebody by pneumonia. And, and then after, he comes back, and he's terrified. He's alone in the room, and he just says he was terrified, he, almost to the level of panic. And um, the nurse walks into the room, and she tries to kiss him, and he won't kiss her. He's afraid. And the line is, you know, you're, you're too afraid to kiss me. And he said, he says, yes. And she says, I would have sucked it out of his lungs with a tube if I thought it would have made any difference. And all of a sudden, right there, you get this incredible sense of something that I think is at the heart of this, which is um, the flu really reversed the heroic narrative of war. All of a sudden, <laughs> you know, it wasn't the soldiers who were the ones that were necessarily the only brave ones. Um, you know, Agnes von Krausky, the woman that Hemingway was involved with, she wound up leaving him at the hospital in Milan to go serve at pandemic centers, hotspots all across Italy. And she actually wrote him a letter where she said, you know, 
I've been thinking about all this time what it would feel like when you left me. I never thought I'd be the one leaving you. And then later on, when he's, you know, he was a little boastful, he was 19, you know, about his wounds. She wrote to him and she said, listen, I want you to know, I've had some pretty hard experiences in this war too. You are you don't get a corner on the market, old dear. <laughs> That's what she wrote to him. And so I think that, you know, there's this book called Viral Modernism by Elizabeth Utka. It just came out last year, 19, uh, 20, uh, 2019. Such strange timing. Mm -hmm. Columbia University Press. And it's, um, it asks the question, why is the flu or the pandemic not represented in much of great literature and even history, but she's really interested in great literature. And she talks about the difference between like grievable loss and ungrievable loss. And without getting too into it, essentially, especially because the war was happening at the same time, understanding loss of life in war was more comprehensible to us. Um, it was, occasioned by clear human actions and decisions. It allowed us, it was politically expedient because it allowed us to celebrate um, our sacrifices and it became a rallying point for patriotism. But the idea of a pandemic, which was in, you know, infecting people indiscriminately and globally was harder to, to manage. Nobody knew how to register those losses in that moment. And it also wasn't, quite honestly, it sounds cruel, but it wasn't politically expedient the way that celebrating war dead were. And there was only as there was only so much grieving that could happen in, in one space. So I thought that was a really interesting insight. And I think, you know, we see a resurgence in pandemic, the history, the study of the pandemic in history in uh, the early 2000s. And now with Utka's book in 2019, finally in literature. But um, it is curious the way that that pandemic was erased. And I'll just say one other thing, there's two other cool resources. This is the kind of interesting work humanities can do. Richard Collier um, put out a call in 1970 uh, to, he put ads in newspapers all across Europe and all across um, the United States and encouraged flu survivors to share their stories with him. And at the um, Imperial War Museum in London, there's this incredible- you said This was 1970, this was? 1970, yeah. Um, it, in the Imperial War Museum in London, there's this incredible Collier archive of firsthand accounts and memories of, of uh, the pandemic that we otherwise would not even have, you know? And the other uh, resources, the CDC maintains an influenza storybook from the 1918 pandemic on its website. Wow. Yeah. But those are incredibly important archives, especially because in the moment, the war, the not the war, excuse me, the pandemic got erased in the immediate historicization of that moment. So. Yeah. So I, if we've gotten the technology right, I know you, you, you shared some, some really interesting images um, that. that oh, sure. Of the, um, of the, of the time. Um, and then also just of, of, um, of Hemingway himself um, at that at that time. Um, yeah, there we so are. Yeah. I yeah. almost forgot about these, but let me. Um, and there we're going backwards. Let me start here. This is actually um, an image of Camp Funston, Kansas. This is an influence award at Camp Funston, um, and so you can see sort of the scale of it. And when they talk in New York about turning the Javits Center into a medical ward, you know, this is, this image is haunting me when I think about that. And um, these are pictures of Hemingway um, in his uniform, his Red Cross uniform. And then this is a picture he sent to his family after he was wounded. And you can see, you know, he's trying to be very brave and smiling. And then uh, the final picture over here is as he was recovering in Italy on his crutches. And then um, because we told the story of Hemingway and Agnes um, today, I thought I'd show a picture of them together. Um, and she was, she was a Red Cross nurse. She was eight years his senior. And, um, and in the end, she decided that they weren't suited, that he was uh, too young for her. And after he, she let him go home and then she wrote the Dear John letter. <laughs> so, um, but those are the pictures that I wanted to share and I'll yeah. give you control back um, now as well. So.
managing conversation and technology and all these. Yeah, I'm getting good at that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. We, you know, indeed, right? Sort of our our life in two dimensions, um, and um, um, you know, which brings me to some one of the questions I've been asking of each of the faculty members I've, I've had these conversations with. Um, just just tell us about your teaching right now. Um, how's it changed? How are you teaching to this moment with your students? What's, you know, what, what you're teaching? What's that experience been like for you? Well, you know, it's, it's a very unfortunate circumstance. Um, but maybe it's my personality, but I choose to focus on uh, the new things that we're learning and the new ways we're being connected. I know um, there have been, you know, people have been able to make this transition somewhat unevenly and everybody feels a really steep learning curve. But overall, I've had a really good experience with my classes. Um, for now, I've decided to teach synchronously at our regular time. And I did that very intentionally to create a sense of community and continued community with us. Um, I can see the value of, of of doing other kinds of activities and, and, and probably will start to do that as well. But one of the things that I, you know, for example, have found somewhat surprising and delightful is that students who in class are usually quite quiet and, and don't contribute, maybe because it seems like a really big commitment to speak out loud in, in a classroom environment, are really active on the chat that runs <laughs> alongside the uh, video feed. And so, and they interact, because all the students have to remain muted usually, otherwise you get too much feedback. So they interact primarily with me, unless they have something big to say um, through the chat. And students who never spoke in class turn out to have the most wicked sense of humor, the most diabolical questions. It feels somehow very liberating, I think, or maybe the chat feels less formal, but it's really wonderful to get to know those students in a whole other way. Yeah. I should mention too another place that you've appeared in addition to this conversation or in some of the help videos with regard to uh, conferencing <laughs> or Microsoft Teams and so um, uh, grateful for that as well but I also think an interesting insight into sort of our presence um, to each other uh, is, is changed by, by this and um, um, I think it's been terrific to see how um, you and other faculty have joined in supporting each other through this work and um, the, the way those communities uh, can, are, are being cultivated in, in, in new ways and, and very, very much based on the relationships that were formed on campus and now um, continue in this, new, in this new reality. What should we be teaching CHC students about this moment? What's important for them to know as we go through this? You know, um, when I think about that, I think, how much more important, at least for me, it is to learn alongside them right now. <laughs> I, I know they're looking to faculty, of course, for some sense of continuity and leadership, but sometimes those things are, are sort of best met by sitting with them through a complex moment. I've started classes, I start classes 10, minute, 10 minutes early now, giving people a chance to get on and get settled and in that time, we have a lot of informal conversation about what people are going through. Um, letting, giving them space to register that what's happening in their lives um, and share that with, giving them a space to share that with each other um, has seemed really important because I think we're all feeling very, um, well, overwhelmed and confused and, uh, you know, I, for one, at this moment, would I don't know that I can do much more than sit in it with them right now and listen to them. But I think, you know, in terms of what I teach, I teach my classes still, of course, um, but I think it's, it's about how, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, I thought at one point maybe I should change some of the literature that I was going to study with them and maybe address some things that were more directly related to pandemics or or, or things like that, but I decided not to do that. I decided to stick with my classes as they were. I thought enough is changing. <laughs> let us tell our own stories to each other. Let us sit together and then let us do the work that we were originally slated to do to the best of our ability in this new environment. That feels enough to me right now. Suzanne, thanks so much for your time this morning.
Dr. Suzanne Del Giza, uh, Professor of English at uh, Chestnut Hill College, uh, 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 Chair of the Center for Integrated Humanities, uh, and all of your work in the area of, of, of health humanities at the college. Uh, it was great to have you share this information today. I'm really uh, delighted that uh, others uh, at the college, including students in other classes, other faculty, will have a chance to engage this information as well. Thanks for your time this morning. Thank you so much. Everyone be well. Yeah, yeah. Thanks again. Thanks.